Okay, so our goal for uh, this morning <coughs> is to connect the API server with the React uh, client. Okay, up to now we just worked on one side or the other. So we developed uh, some uh, uh, HTTP API endpoints uh, in Express last week. And in the previous weeks uh, we uh, played a bit with the uh, interaction and uh, rendering of application using React on the client side. Um, what is missing is a mechanism, what we are missing up to now, is a mechanism for our React application to be able to call the remote APIs and use the data so that we can delete uh, those ugly fake data with question and answer and try to uh, run um, with real data coming from the database, coming from the API server. So we need a, some ingredients to be put together, okay? Um, first of all, we uh, need a mechanism for being able to call a remote API from our browser, from any browser application, from any client application, okay? So we developed our Express server, but uh, we could call you know, uh, this API in testing mode by our development environment, uh, but how can we um, call an, a remote API from JavaScript code? Uh, basically, the modern way of uh, issuing an HTTP call to a remote server today is uh, using the fetch API. So fetch is a, a function in the JavaScript uh, standard library implemented by the browser, so it's not implemented by Node. Fetch is a function which is only available inside the browsers. Uh, that we can use to send uh, asynchronous HTTP requests uh, to any uh, API server. We can send a GET or a POST or any kind of request uh, from our own JavaScript code, okay? Uh, so, how does it work? Our big picture is uh, we have in the right hand side of the picture here, we have the, the API server, okay? Imagine what we developed last week. We have all the get post, uh, all the routes for uh, the put, the delete, so all the APIs that we developed uh, that uh, implement some operation on the database, on the underlying database. Well, that's it. It's running on a web server somewhere on a given a IP address and port, okay? On the other hand, we have a web application. Maybe it's React. So we are running that with the run dev and it will start a web server on a given address and port, which will deliver content to the browser. Okay, so the component will, react in, will render inside the browser and the user can interact. At a given point, uh, our React components uh, would like uh, to send a request uh, to the API server. So this is the box we are working with. Imagine we are rendering the home page of our list of questions. So the application should query the API server calling get slash questions, which is the API for getting ex exactly that kind of information. Or if the user is adding a new answer, then on the click of the add button, uh, our form component uh, should uh, in some way issue a put, uh, sorry, a post onto the API server for posting a new answer and so on. So we are inside here. We are in the client. Our code will run in the browser being issued or served by the front end web server. Okay, remember that the code is running in the browser, but we need a web server somewhere to, to deliver the, um, the HTML of the index and all the JavaScript of the application bundle, or of all the components, okay? Uh, so when you are running the, in devel uh, the development environment, uh, React, uh, in the development environment, a React application, you are actually opening a, a small web server, the one running on localhost port 573 or whatever this number is, okay? It's a, so we, are, we will have, in a moment, two web servers running on our computer. One serving the APIs, the other serving the front-end application. And these two 
web servers need to communicate. Oh, actually, it's not the web servers that need to communicate, but it's the application inside the browser that needs to call the other server. Okay? Um, we actually have two parts of this journey. One is uh, the low level call of an HTTP method with the fetch API. And then we need to learn how to make these fetch API calls uh, in a way which is React friendly, friendly to the React framework. Okay? Uh, and we will learn about the hook, which is called this effect mm -hmm. later on. But first, let's understand how, how a fetch works. Um, fetch uh, is quite uh, easy, basically. It's an API of one, just one function, fetch. Um, that gets two parameters, one or two parameters. The first parameter is uh, the address that you want to call. So you are in a code, in your JavaScript code, you want to call an API. So you need to do a get or a put or a post to a given IP address and port and URL um, uh, fragments, okay? A full address. You pass that as a URL to the first parameter of fetch and the browser will start an HTTP request. So normally the browser makes a HTTP request on its own whenever it needs. In this case, we, are, we can ask the browser to initiate a new HTTP request. And uh, fetch uh, returns uh, a promise. Of course, it's an asynchronous operation, so fetch will return a promise that will resolve, when it will be resolved, it will resolve to a, an object, a response object, that represents the information of the response coming from the server. Remember that in the server, we built a response object in Express. This response object in Express, so we have response.send, response.json, or whatever, uh, it's uh, trans translated by Express into an HTTP response message, a text message encoded with the HTTP protocol. This message is sent back from the server to the client, uh, to the browser, the fetch API will receive this HTTP response, will parse it again, and will put all the information into a response object. Okay, the response object in the browser, the object returned by fetch, is not the same object as the response object in, in Express. Uh, we should split our brain in two because one part is uh, the server and one part will be the client, uh, and we are using slightly different objects to exchange information between two separate systems. Hmm? Um, and so this promise contains the content of the response, or the promise can be rejected in the case the response cannot be obtained. Maybe we have a network error, the AP address is wrong, or something like that. But if a response is obtained, then I have another response object, then can, I can query it, and so on. The first parameter of fetch is the URL, the second parameter is an object to customize the request. Okay, uh, so uh, by default, if I don't provide any second parameter, uh, I will issue a get. But if I want to issue a post or a put, if you want to send a body with a request, uh, I need to specify all the extra information in a second parameter of the fetch. Um, so it returns a promise, so let's make a, a very simple Call. If I call fetch with a given URI, that can be for a static page, can be for a dynamic page, for an API, whatever. Any address, this fetch instruction will ask the browser to do a get on this address. And uh, I can decide to handle that it's a promise, so with then or with uh, uh, await is the same, of course. In both cases, I resolve to an object, which is a response object, that can be, again, used for extracting information. I can extract the response status, I can extract the response headers, I can extract the response body, maybe the body is formatted in JSON, so I want to convert it into um, a JavaScript object by parsing the JSON, and so on. There are methods of response that we are going to see. Um, and so on. 
so in this case, what I'm doing, I read in the, the right hand side because it's easier to read, but the information is the same. We have a chain of dents here and we have a chain of awaits here. And this await uh, waits until the fetch returns. And uh, now we have a response object and we can extract the data from this object. And uh, the data extraction is also asynchronous. It doesn't need to be really asynchronous, but they made it asynchronous. Uh, maybe because potentially the, uh, the body can be very large, so you don't want to block the, the execution while the parser is doing, is working. But it's just a detail. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we do a fetch, so this is an easy. Uh, I, we, I only, I, we see, sorry, you see that we only have one parameter here, which is the address. We don't have the second parameter yet. Because we, in this case, we just need uh, a, get, a simple get. Mm -hmm. And with a simple get, we, we get a response back, the response object, which is uh, the asynchronous resolution of the promise. Uh, that has some properties. Basically, the important is the OK property uh, that will tell me whether the response had a successful status code. So remember, HTTP status code go from 100 to 599, and uh, the three and four and five uh, uh, signal some kind of error, okay, or problem in executing the, the, um, the response. Mm -hmm. um, the behavior of uh, uh, fetch is that it always try to resolve a response. So if you have a, a server error, for example, status code 500, this will not create a failure of the promise, will not reject the promise. We'll resolve the promise, so we'll have a response object where you can extract all the nice information about uh, what went wrong, for example. But this promise, which re this response will not be okay. So basically, we have uh, um, what is that? Two levels of error handling. One, the first level is uh, the promise is rejected. So the promise returned by fetch. When you call fetch, you don't know whether it will fail or not. You just have a promise immediately, and then the promise will fail, will be rejected. The promise will be rejected only if we have network errors. Only if the browser cannot exchange information with the server. In all the other cases, so even where we have a 404 not found or 500 server error and so on, the promise will be resolved. So we'll not go into the catch branch. But it will be resolved with a status OK or not OK according to the status code. So OK will be true if the status code is positive, let's say. OK will be false if the status code is outside this range. So basically, we have to do two types of tests. One is uh, um, when we fetch something, we always have uh, the, what is that? The catch clause for this promise can be a, ca a catch if you're using then catch or can be a, a, um, a try catch statement if you're using await, where we are capturing network errors, basically. And all the other errors can be handled, uh, that may happen, uh, should be handled in the then case, in the positive case. We're checking if the response is not OK then I have some error. Otherwise, I can go on and process the result of the... Um, of course, uh, having a positive response doesn't guarantee that maybe the data is okay, no? because maybe the JSON is not well formed, it's a duplicate information or whatever, so there may be other problems down the way. But there is not a problem of the HTTP call anymore. Okay. When the response resolves or rejects, uh, the HTTP call is over. And if I say it another way, for the promise to be resolved, the HTTP connection should be closed. Which means that in the server, if you forget to, close, to, to send a response, the browser will stay hanging and waiting for a response, and the, um, the promise will not resolve nor reject. No? This may happen, uh, especially when you have an API that doesn't need to return anything. So delete. It doesn't need to return anything. But if you forget to do response.send in the server, 
uh, the request will not be responded by your response and so the fetch call will not uh, complete and eventually it will time out so you, uh, you will have a, an exception with a timeout in, a, in it and the problem is that sometimes this timeout happens when this code is no longer available but it will happen 30 seconds later and so maybe the user already navigated away this is a problem we'll, we'll uh, consider better when we do that in, in react huh? just remember that the cycle is in the browser i call a fetch the browser will send an http re request express will you know um, activate a route for that url and uh, put the rest the request in the request object in express then express will do all the queries all the work they need to do and then we'll send a response back the response is encapsulated into an http response message that goes back to the browser and this message is used for resolving the uh, promise okay all this way anytime um, once we have the response we can extract information for example from the headers uh, from the status status is the number for 0 far 200 zero, zero or the status text uh, or uh, no, all the information which is in the response body or in the uh, why is that sorry I will jump uh, okay we can also read uh, the response body so not just the head the others are not very important <laughs> are not very useful except for the status it can be can give us some information um, the body is not uh, that, uh, directly, um, it cannot be read directly because uh, uh, it's, a, it's a stream object basically. So you can only read it once. And there are two methods. So body is a, a property. Response.body is a property, but we don't use it no? because we need to parse the stream. Uh, there are already two methods. There are methods and non properties uh, that help us to read the string one is dot text that will return the body as a string and the other is json that will analyze the body as in json syntax and will be an object a javascript object corresponding to that json okay so normally if the response contains json we will parse it with json if the uh, response contains text uh, it will uh, will uh, maybe a string with an error message we can just uh, pass it with the text uh, and get a string and this is the reason why these two methods return a promise because they are passing a stream and so they need to wait until the stream is um, unrolled up to the end mm -hmm. so these are the two methods or especially json that we can use after the response has been uh, resolved to extract information from the body of the response itself Concerning the, the request, uh, I, we mentioned that uh, there was a second parameter in fetch to customize the request. And customizing the request means basically specifying a method different from get, which is the default, or specifying some extra headers, like content type, for example, that we need to provide if we are sending some JSON body or providing a body in the request. So maybe it's a post, maybe it's a put, so it requires a body to be sent. And we provide these three, let's say, items of information as properties of this object. So this, in this second parameter is an object with, with these properties, or maybe a more, but these are the, <laughs> the three key ones. So for example, I want to do a post to a given URL. So I call fetch with the URL as the first parameter and an object as the second parameter. And in this object, I will specify the method as a string, post. The headers as an object containing many properties for all the headers I want to add. In this case, I only want to add one header. So I have one object with one property and the key of the object is the name of the header and the value of the object is the value of the header so and finally body 
is the string content of uh, uh, what we want to send into the body. So it should be a string. If we have an object, we must convert it to JSON. For example, with this method, json.stringify, which is JSON is a package in the, in the standard library. So it's available without importing anything. It just takes an object and converts it to JSON. And so this becomes a string, and this string will be inserted into the body. So we are preparing the request. And then fetch, so we are cast away. We are starting from a very simple get request, and then we are changing the method from get to post. We are adding some headers, and we are adding a body. And then we are ready to be sent, uh, and then, of course, to be processed uh, by the, in this case, it doesn't have a, a then in this case because it's a post, so I'm not expecting any, any results back, but usually we, we do. So if we want to uh, issue, uh, um, um, call an API which is not in get, is not a get API, we should always provide basically these three parameters uh, into the object. But then the, the behavior is the same. So in both cases, we get a response back, and this response can be resolved, and so on. Um, okay, oh, well, this is just uh, something that would tell us that sometimes we need uh, to issue a sequence of calls. Okay, so maybe we get uh, the list of users, uh, and then when we have the list of users, we pick one and we want to get uh, the information about that specific user, for example. So we make a call that depends on the results of a previous call, a previous API call. Uh, but there's nothing special about this. Uh, we just remember to, uh, that these calls are asynchronous, so we need to await for the response of the first one before sending the second one. So we need to, by, by default, fetches are asynchronous, so they go in parallel. We need to, if we need to, them to, do, to be in sequence, uh, we, need, we must, of course, uh, have a blocking behavior with await. Hmm? Uh, in the other case, in which maybe you want to load a lot of stuff at the same time, they can, they can go in parallel, for example. So it's uh, one thing they can do, but it's just uh, a corner case. You can use uh, uh, um, promise.all, for example, that will uh, uh, issue in parallel many fetches and wait until all the promises are returned. So you can do that. But it's only uh, special cases. So let's, before making something more complex, let's try to make a simple example out of this, okay? So what I did is to prepare for you and for me, we are in exercise 12, using fetch from a very simple JavaScript client, okay? So what I prepared here is uh, in week 11, is a folder called server, which is exactly the same exercise we did last week that I completed during the week uh, and, they, and they published, okay? So the API server that we designed together last Tuesday. Uh, there's only one, one detail, I already write, wrote that in, uh, in, um, in Telegram, on Telegram, but uh, I want to stress it uh, um, because I did a design mistake for this method here, the increase of the vote. Okay, uh, in, the, in the design, I, I had written put for this operation, and in fact, it would be wrong, conceptually wrong, because uh, issuing a new vote uh, will, all, every time I issue a new vote, uh, I will increase the vote by one. Uh, so put should be an idempotent method. Uh, if, if I repeat a put, uh, the result should not, be, should not change. Since in this case the result must change, put is not a good choice. It's better to have post that will add something, add the new vote. Put is okay when we are editing the object. We are replacing an object with a new version of itself. And if I put twice in a row, so I replace an object twice in a row with a new version of itself, well, it's the same as overwriting one or two or three times the new version is always the same. If the content of the put is the same, the result in the database will be the same. If I send three votes, each time the object will change. 
so it cannot be repeated uh, the call so that was the why um, we had uh, remember in our design document we analyzed two opportunity for voting one is uh, the client uh, will store a vote and put will be okay in this case because I'm writing a number in the server in changing a number into an object and I'm telling you the number the body will contain the new score we abandoned this because uh, it's not safe for asynchronous behaviors no? we mentioned that if there are many clients that are trying to send the same score some increase can be lost uh, and the other alternative was to have a, a call that will ask the server to increase the number but this should be a post so basically the mistake was writing put and instead of post here last week okay but Apart from this, and apart from the fact that it completed implementation, we have a server then we, that we can run. So, uh, maybe I need to download the packages. And, uh, uh, no more, index, we can run it. Okay. And now we know that we can debug it. So it's the same code as last week. Uh, maybe we can get a list of questions. And I have it here. So it's working, our server. In our picture is this one. OK? Now, we want to try to call some of these APIs from a web page. So what I did is to create another uh, directory that they call simple client with an express application that will just serve uh, static pages so what I did here I cannot basically I can't load the uh, uh, HTML pages uh, from files from our uh, is it a question yes go ahead what about patch. patch okay patch would be also an option yes if you want only to change one parameter no, no, no. patch it would be the same as put uh, usually you use put when you want to replace an entire object and patch when you want to change one property of an object but that ideally patch will provide the new value and not ask for an increase of that value huh? patch is in the it should be then potent too um, okay, so we are creating a client. I instead of writing just the HTML code and uh, run it from the file system by you know, clicking on the file, uh, it will have some limitations. For example, fetch cannot be called from uh, uh, a local file. Okay, we need a web server to issue the JavaScript that can um, say web pages loaded from files instead of from the HTTP, have a lot of limitations in the behavior of JavaScript. So what I did was just to implement a very stupid Express application. This is the full application, okay, of the client. What does it do? It simply uses the static middleware, and static in Express is a middleware that will, uh, say, monitor the content of a directory, and will just uh, return all the files uh, in the directory so I'm building a server for a static website I didn't implement any route here okay and there are no routes here basically this static will uh, intercept all the routes uh, and uh, deliver static files from the public directory so it's a way of just of pulling up a web server that does nothing except serving files from a folder and in this folder, I have an index.html that loads a script file. So very, very minimal. And we need to work, it, work it here, okay, in this script file. So what I'm doing here is to open a second application. And let's see if I can do that in this way. Uh, like this, okay. So I split the terminal down there, 
and I have uh, the server still running this window, and now I am in the client uh, window, and I will run the client. They are both node applications, and I implemented them so that the client uh, is running in a port 3001, which is different from 3000, that is the port of the server. Okay? So the server will respond to API calls on 3000, and the client uh, will publish a website uh, on uh, 3001. And this website is very minimal. What I did in the HTML is to have a button and a text block, and preformatted text block. What I want to do, just to show how fetch is working, is to click on the load button and have here the list of questions displayed here, right? Okay, so right now, this is static. So this is just index.html, nothing more. And sorry for the zoom, I can never find a good, uh, this, we have a button and we have the text block, preformatted text block uh, for the response. We have uh, two IDs, I call uh, load button result, this like this, and so we'll try. Of course, it's loading script.js, uh, but uh, the script is, is empty, so we need to write it. So what I want to do, well, let's remember what we did when we did the client-side programming in JavaScript without React. We register an event tender on the load button, and the event tender will issue the fetch and populate the content of this uh, element here, of this result element. Okay? And we work in, uh, what is that? Script.js. Okay, so we, we need to register an event tender on the button. We do everything into the event tender add the event listener of the um, content loaded event. Remember what we did? When the DOM is loaded, then execute the function. And this function will register an event tender on the button. So we find the button, get uh, element by ID, which was called, uh, I wrote it, but I forgot it, uh, was called uh, load button, load button. And now we can register an event tender on this button, button dot uh, add event listener for the event type uh, click for doing what? For, so right now here I'm the event tender of the click of the button. What do I want to do when I click on the button? Fetch the list of questions. Call the API server with the list of questions. So I'm calling, basically, the, I want to get a response out of a URL. Uh, okay, so this is the idea. I, want, I have a uh, URL to call and I want the response. Basically, you should remember that fetch returns a promise, so if I want to process the results, I need to await for the result of this promise. And if I want to wait, this callback should be asynchronous. Okay, let's add async. And now we know that this API is working, we just saw it, and returning a JSON. So we can extract the list of questions by parsing the JSON of the response if this response is okay. So if response. is okay, then we can extract the body. Uh, with the with a list of questions. 
by just parsing the JSON uh, uh, again with an await because it's asynchronous response dot JSON. And now I have a JavaScript object uh, questions containing that list of elements. And uh, I can think of, uh, maybe let's first uh, console.log uh, questions. And then we Okay, so I, the next step will be to uh, modify the page with this result. But for the moment, let's just check that we are getting the result. Okay. So the fetch code is actually this one. All the rest is just for activating it with a click of the button. Uh, before we run it, console.log, on which console I am logging here? This one or this one? Left or right? Neither. On the browser's console. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so bad, yes. Uh, because this code, we developed it here, but here is just a static file. This JavaScript is not running on the server for this simple client application. This window here is running this code. Express. This JavaScript is running in the browser. So this console will be the browser console. Okay, we have three guys here running code. The server, the API server, the web application server, which is now a very simple Express, but then will be the um, React development server run dev if we run dev. and then we have the browser or the browsers plural because there may be many people connecting to the application and each of them is running some piece of javascript hmm? okay let's try to run it so we are in the browser we reload the page we should see that now no i didn't save it sorry i'm saving and restarting the server I will load the application, and now I see the script in the browser. And I click on load, and I should see here a get for questions, a new call no, being done by the fetch instruction. And it works, and it printed this code here. Um, this is basically a surprise because it shouldn't have worked. Let me try to open the same application with Chrome with a different browser. It's not Chrome or Firefox. I will explain in a moment. Localhost 3001. Console. Network. Okay. Let's reload it so you can see in the. Okay. If I click on the load here. I get a strange error. Okay. Um, also, Firefox did this error yesterday, but then I, I resolved the problem, and then Firefox remembers the resolution in its, own, it's in, in its cache. So that's why I changed the browser in, be able to, in order to be able to see the, the problem. Yes? Why? The, sorry? Yes, we are issuing a get. By default, it's a get. Yes, with the, by giving the second parameter, with the method equal to post. Okay, so the method is a part of the object uh, of the second parameter, which is an object. Okay. Okay. So what happened here? We did everything 
right, probably, but uh, we are getting a strange error message saying access to fetch this IP, this URL, which is right, which is correct, from this origin is not, has been blocked by the course policy. Course, what's this beast, okay? Course stand from cross origin something, request uh, something, I don't remember. Uh, and it's a, a check that the browser does. It's a security feature of the browser that will uh, prevent you from calling APIs on servers that are not uh, authorized. What I'm doing is that this JavaScript code, script.js, has uh, an origin. The origin is the web server from which this code has been downloaded. And the origin of the script is, where am I? This web server, running on localhost 3001. So by default, the browser will let you do fetch calls, any HTTP calls, only to the same origin. So I could call any fetch on localhost 2001, and the browser will not complain, okay? But if I'm trying to do a call to a different um, to a different address, in this case, localhost 3000, the browser will expect that server 3000 to authorize me. And so the server running at 3000 should provide a list of uh, origins that it trusts, of trusted origins. So the browser before saying that, before accepting, if you look, the network call was successful, 200 OK. So the API actually was executed, but it's the browser that will stop you from reading the result. Well, it's a strange feature because it's intended to protect the server, the 3000 server, the extra server, the cross-origin servers, but this extra protection is only implemented in the browser. Okay, imagine you are publishing an API server for the world. Our simple API server. Everybody can access it. But I want to be sure that only the application that maybe are partner, my partners or are paying for me or have some you know, authorization for accessing the API server can actually call it. So in my server, when I publish it, I can describe the cross-origin policy. Which origins can call me? And which origins means uh, any web browser in the world whose JavaScript has been downloaded by that, by those origins, one or more. Otherwise, the browser is saying, okay, you are trying to do a cross-origin call, I'm blocking you. It can be circumvented in thousands of ways, for example, but for the moment, what we can do is to tell the uh, server to declare the origins it will trust. And this is done by uh, adding some headers in the response. Okay, uh, the browser does the request, the server sends a response, and the response will be one header saying, okay, I trust you. I accept to be called from the origin that you declared. And so, it, it, so for example, the, uh, what is that? In the request header, request headers are down below. You see that uh, we are declaring from where the call is coming. Okay, the call is from this. Actually, the call is coming from the browser. 
but the browser declares uh, where the JavaScript was downloaded for, from, the origin of the call, okay? And the policy imposed by the browser is same origin. And in this case, we have no course configured, so it will be blocked. If we want to unblock it, um, we must configure the server here by sending back an extra header saying, for me, it's okay. This, uh, uh, so let's go back to the server for a moment. This can be done by uh, an extension, or uh, by, uh, sorry, an, um, an, another middleware of, uh, uh, of Express, which is called, uh, you guess, course, okay? So Express, if you have a look, uh, course, we have this, oh, close it. We have this uh, middleware that we can install in our Express APIs, in the API server, okay? because it's the server that should accept. And uh, basically you load this module and you install it as a middleware. In this case, uh, what you are doing is that I will accept everything. Basically we are turning off the protection. This course installed in this way will always say yes to any request, to any origin. If you want to filter for the origins, you can specify them in some way. So for example, I want to trust only this origin or this set of origins. And when I install course as a middleware, uh, you just pass these options as a parameter. So course without any parameter will allow everybody. Course with some parameter will specify which origins are we trusting, okay? And then there's a lot of uh, stuff to do. Maybe you want to authorize an origin only after it did some checks and validation, so it should be dynamic. Uh, should we provide a callback for selecting call by call, moment by moment, who you want to trust or not. But, yes? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think I would use calls to, uh, we did, this is only blocking uh, um, API calls for calling an API server. It does not block any HTML loading or an image loading or a JavaScript loading. Only the JavaScript code that executes a fetch. This is all, the only part is affected, so it would be effective for that. So uh, in, we, not, we need to stop the server, install, course in the server side, the middleware, and we can then require it. And uh, install it in our API server. Let's make it stupid for a moment. Now, if I rerun the server, no, not installed, run, not run. Okay. Sorry? Require, yes. Ah. Okay. And if I try to do the same operation, so I only change the server, I didn't change the client, I didn't even reload this page. I'm doing the load again, and now it works. It printed on the console this call. Okay, so whenever I'm calling API server, that API server should allow the origin from which the calls are coming. The stupid way is just allow everything, the better way is to configure it properly. Okay, this is not, we are not over because, uh, okay, we need to finish the exercise by, let's close this, and going back to script, uh, in this case, we don't want to log the question, we want to put them into the element. So we have a uh, result block, uh, document, dot get element by ID was called the result, if I remember correctly. 
and then result dot inner text equal to uh, questions. So it should, uh, sorry, now I need to refresh the application. Uh, okay, object, object, uh, sorry. I, these are raw objects, so they, they don't have any two string. Uh, they are, these are objects, are, they've just been constructed from the JSON, so they have no methods whatsoever, okay? So okay, what I can do is to maybe just to write uh, the, um, the name. Refresh, load, yeah. Okay. Okay, so this is what uh, Fetch is doing. Uh, we still don't, are not checking any problems, so actually I should have an S block here. Uh, if the response is not okay, in this case, there's nothing to do. Or maybe write a message down the, the for example, let's put, the, let's extract this result uh, on, on the top. And so they can reuse it here, result.inner text equal to error maybe and this for application errors I say application error and in our uh, web server we should provide a message an error message somewhere okay for example like we did in the server let's go back to the server again when something's wrong we do something like that send an error message with a status code, with an error status code. So this error message will be part of the body. So it's good that you have a response that has been fully parsed, and so we can extract the body here. Even if the response is not okay, the body is still there. The response has been received and parsed down. So we could, in the client, not just say application error, but also extract maybe a response to JSON or response to text. Uh, depends on, uh, in our case, we just sent, uh, sorry, we just sent uh, a string here. So one possibility could be to extract the text. Uh, from await uh, response dot uh, text and then we can do something like that plus uh, uh, error text remember to await otherwise you have a promise hmm? the, re the result of the text is a promise is not a string in this case very difficult for it to fail, this API it doesn't fail, so uh, it's difficult to come here for all these questions. Um, maybe we can, inside question, do something bad like, uh, what is that? No, 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 not the question, sorry. Inside the, the API, we could uh, change the name of the database. I don't know. So we'll not find uh, the database. And if I try it on the client, uh, sorry, I didn't reload the application. It's uh, now issuing a uh, server error. I don't know, I didn't save it, sorry. We, are, we get used in React to uh, the automatic save and reload the, of the application. We always remember that we have a, step of, <laughs> a sequence of steps to do. We save the script, we restart the client, 
and we load the application on the client and then okay, we can get the message there. Oh, this is for application errors. So uh, the network connection is okay, but the status code is not. Let's put it back to the, where are you lost? Yeah. Okay, I'm restoring that. And the other type of error are network errors that will uh, cause the fetch to fail with the rejection. So one possibility is to have a try catch block around all of this. And then here we have, okay, we don't have the response text, of course, but we have a network error. And the error text could be from uh, response of status, for example. Response, uh, sorry. No, 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 uh, try. This it catch why yes try await blah 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 and catch so in this case uh, I don't have a response object no I can't do that So, for example, if I'm, so let's just check that it's still working. Missing, closing parenthesis, line 22. Ah, I did some. Okay, so it's working again. Uh, let's imagine maybe we have we send the the wrong API. So I, I modify this one, and what I get is uh, an application error. Application error, not uh, uh, network error, because it's a 404 code. And we didn't customize the 404 code, and so we get what the React, what Express is doing by default in the body. But if we, instead of port 3000, we, we change the port number, and they will load the application, the behavior should be different so that it will try. And it's a network error with a connection refused because it's we are asking to open a port which is not open. Okay, so there are the two levels of error handling. So let's put it again in a working shape. One is network errors so that we check from the failure of the fetch. We try catch if you are using a sync or with catch if you are using the normal um, pro um, callback based promise processing. And the other is the application errors where the code is not 200 and you check it simply with the properties of the response object, which is probably the most interesting because it means that the user is doing something wrong or network errors, something that you cannot do much against. Okay. Um, so this is an isolated example of what it means to call an API from a JavaScript uh, uh, application, like this, all of this, basically. Here, of course, we are mixing uh, uh, processing of the fetch uh, with the um, update of the page. Hmm? Now, what we want to do is try to uh, 
move the same idea into a React application. So right now the simple client is just a simple express with a static uh, website, but how can we do that in the React world? Let's first see how we can update this picture here. Okay, this was a simple picture. Now, how, um, how can we move that into React? And uh, there are many ways of doing that. Basically, what we already saw is that we need two servers. One is the API server and the other is the application server that will serve the application to the browser. That's it. There are many ways, different ways of combining this, okay, of uh, obtaining this. Uh, the simplest one is actually having two servers, really having two servers. So like we did here, I have two terminals and they run the client on one side and the server on the other side and they communicate as long as they live on different ports, they can do that, okay? On different uh, HTTP ports. Uh, of course, we need to solve the course problem like we did uh, so that the server will accept, uh, uh, say, a, a fetch calls from a different origin. Um, another option, and we work with this, basically, in the course, because it's easier, okay? We have the server and the client decoupled and everything is uh, deployed immediately when we save the files. Um, the other possibility is to pack the React application into a single directory. So what we are doing now with React is uh, we are running the application in development mode. We are running a small web server that will deliver the application and uh, it has all the uh, reloading functionality and so on. Okay. But once we finish our application, we can just uh, run a build operation. Huh? npm run build instead of run dev. And uh, the build operation will create uh, one directory called build usually that contains all the JavaScript, HTML and JavaScript and CSS files of my application. So right now the components are parsed uh, in real time, basically, no? while we load in them. The build operation is trying to pack all the components, uh, uh, remove all the JSX syntax uh, by going down just to simple JavaScript, uh, by including all the um, JavaScript code from the node modules, only the, the function that you're using, and building a single bundle, they call it. One big file with everything together, minimized without the spaces and so on. And at the end, they will be only static files, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, that can be put into, into the static directory of any web server. Huh? Um, right, we'll see you later. And the, that package, the bundle, can be stored anywhere. So we could imagine of uh, storing the React bundle into a simple Express, sorry, into a simple Express uh, um, server. Maybe the same server with the API. So we don't have any cross-origin problem. So we have the server with a lot of routes for the API, plus one static folder in which you are copying the React application. It can be done. It's not a very good idea for two reasons. One is every time you modify something in the React application, you need to rebuild it and recopy it to the server. It takes minutes, not seconds. The build operation is quite time expensive. And second, uh, it's quite uh, unlikely that the application server and the API server are really the same server, the same machine. And having the servers in a separate machine, in a separate uh, application, is more realistic because it's more like a, 
okay we have a server for the api and then one or more applications that may be mobile application maybe web application or whatever that access those same apis and so it's uh, uh, having two explicit servers is more realistic and it's also easier in development mode and at the end you will always have to do the build for publishing your application somewhere but probably this somewhere is not the same machine where the api server is running hmm? also for protection reasons or whatever so in our picture what we have is a browser always this little guy using the browser with react components and now we learned in some way that this react component uh, must call fetch sometimes for reading data for storing data for authentic data and this react application is running in the browser but has been shipped by an origin by a server that contains the origin of all the javascript and we, we are running this server with our this development command here run in development mode so here we have all the javascript we write and this javascript is running in the browser and this javascript will be doing fetches it's one server the react development server is quite limited no? it's nice because it does all the automatic refreshing and something like that but it doesn't run express it's not express it's another server and so you cannot create your own routes you cannot implement an api even if we have an, API, uh, an http server here you cannot use it for implementing your own apis in fact uh, we have another server an api server which is the endpoint of these fetches that we implement uh, using express uh, by defining the api routes we already have it so the the overall of course this express application does not understand jsx and does not is not able to serve react applications so we need both of them the browser will initially contact the react server and will get from this the index.html which is basically empty and all the javascript that will build the react application with all the libraries and whatever here after this initial loading this server is no longer needed once the application is loaded i don't communicate with this anymore maybe except for loading some images or something like that that are stored in the static folder of the server and then all the chat will be done between the browser and the api server of course with the course authorization So we have three points where JavaScript is running. Basically, we have two points where JavaScript is running, inside the browser here and inside the API server. Here is a place where we are writing the JavaScript, but it's not running there on the server in the simple way when we are using React. There are more advanced ways of using React on other frameworks where some components are rendered on the browser, some components are rendered on the server. So actually, there we'll talk a lot more, but it's some something that, we, that, that doesn't fit in our 60 hours, okay? Of course. Um, so we go for this solution, which is in the left uh, picture, instead of the right one. The right one would be creating an application bundle and publish that in a folder inside the API server. We don't go this way; we go to the two servers way. So uh, practically, we have our API server with the routes defined on port 3000 and the React server, which is running in development mode, running on this port. Two independent servers, remember to configure cores, otherwise the fetch will fail. Um, I don't know if there's anything more to say here of course we already said that uh, okay and it's only saying here that we can have a fetch in the client that will of course match to a route defined in the in the api server just remember to check the port numbers for for both 
So the last point, so what, let's do one step. Let me kill our simple client. Let me change the directory. And I have another directory which is called really client. And this client directory, let me close some files there. This client directory is nothing more than a copy of the React, where is that? Server client. Is a copy of the React application that we had two weeks ago. Okay? So I can start it. And it will start the React application open that we developed a couple of weeks ago. This application is running with fake data. We know now that uh, we can replace those fake data with uh, API calls with fetch so that this application can now run on real data. Real data from, from the server here. So again, we have two server, the API server on this window and the client, uh, the React server on that window. We need uh, to learn how to get rid of all this fake data and replace them with fetch operations. Well, what you could think is, oh, let's write a fetch call here and load all the data. It could work, but only initially when we, run, when we launch the application. What we want to do is to be able to uh, call the fetch anytime. Because maybe we, we are moving from one question to another, so we need to, to see the answers of different questions. We are changing a vote, we are, changing, we, are, we are continually calling APIs. The client it will be continually talking and exchanging information with the server. And all of this must be done in a way which is compatible with React. We cannot just put a fetch inside a function. Because you remember that a component is rendered by React one or two or many times or never, depending on how React works. So the fetch cannot just be executed there. Also, remember what we saw when we played with the state, you cannot have an asynchronous call here in the function because the result will not be available until after the rendering. And we cannot do an await here. So there should be a mechanism for doing operation in React component which handle side effects, which handle something which is outside the normal rendering cycle of the component. And this is the menu for the next hour after the break.